Well, hello, guys and girls. Welcome back to another Live with John Q&A in our studio here in the Parkzilla Cavern, if you want to call it that. And actually, this will be the last one for me for the year because at 3.31, I'm doing a Christmas staycation. So that'll, that'll wrap it up for me for the year because I looked at my PTO hours and I'm about to lose like two weeks worth if I don't go ahead and take some time off. So I'm going to become a, an indigenous object on uh, my couch for the next two to three weeks. That's my plan. <laughs> Tolerate family and friends. But before I can do that, I have to spend a little bit of time or I get to spend a little bit of time doing some Q&A with you fine folks. But, but before we dive into uh, last week's questions, I want to share something with you that well, quite honestly, all of you made happen. I got a little acknowledgement from the YouTube guys or girls saying that we had surpassed 100,000 subscribers. And actually, we're at 116,000 subscribers, a little bit more, and, and rising. So thank you. This is actually your award. You made this possible. And I think we're creeping up on 24 million views. So... Who would have thought, you know, five years ago or six years ago, CEO came to me and said, hey, John, why don't you do a, a how-to video changing oil on a 400EX just to see if we can do this or not. And it evolved into all this. And I can't go into it yet, but big, big changes coming down the pipe for um, Partzilla and its overreaching company, the controlling company, Outdoor Network. They're in the middle of doing something huge and uh, hopefully they'll let me share you, share that with you as it will be nearing completion in the early spring but that aside we are gonna go ahead and go back to a couple of questions that i missed last week oh one more thing uh, the giveaway that we've got a uh, a new code for an additional 100 in entries and let me make sure I get this right. I'm sure the guys or girls or girls are going to post it in there. Um, oh, 100 more. 100, the letter, I mean, the number 100 more, M-O-R-E, and go enter to win that machine. Because remember, we are giving it away on the 3rd or the 4th of January. So good luck on winning that one. All right. Boy J had asked me, I want to know the connector rod and main journal bearings for a CBR 600RR 7 through 12 color chart. Well, of course, I didn't know it all off the top of my head, but I do have access to all the dealer site information. And instead of me trying to rattle off all these numbers, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to kind of do a, a, a screenshot and you just uh, take a peek at that. I know it's in reverse, but yeah, you, you can figure it out. <laughs> so there it is, boy, Jay, right there. Just remember to look at your crankshaft and the, the markings on your case, and then go into that chart to find out the, the correct um, bearing for your machine. But I do want to uh, also suggest that it's nine times out of 10, that's going to be accurate, but you still want to use plastic gauge just to make sure that uh, those tolerances are correct before you uh, bolt everything together. So, what else do we have? All right, Mike had asked me, good day, John. I have a question involving my wet centrifugal, centrifugal clutch. I bought a 2006 Polaris Hawk uh, 300, which has proven to be a, a true lemon. Sorry to hear that. Once I got it running, I was making, it was making a sporadic banging noise at idle. At higher RPMs, it doesn't make that noise. Also, at idle, the primary clutch is spinning, which I don't think was right. No, the primary should. Uh, would you point to a faulty uh, centrif uh, centrif centrifugal clutch or springs causing the pro these problems? This issue uh, also shuts down the motor as if it catches and stops the crank from spinning, I'm sure. I uh, sure hope you can help shed some light on this for me. Thanks in advance. Uh, love your videos, man. Mike, I'm not super familiar with the, uh, the the Hawkeye 300, but I don't think it has a centrifugal clutch, um, like the, the setup on, on uh, Yamaha Grizzly. I mean, I know that they do, 
but I think that goes straight to the uh, the primary clutch, and then you've got your secondary clutch. You know, of course, the belt in between. So that I think that primary is spinning the whole time, and the belt's just kind of laying there, not really moving. You know, waiting to be engaged. Uh, the Polaris is just a little bit different than the uh, than the uh, the Yamaha, where, which it's engaged all the time, and you have to get over that centrifugal clutch to actually move forward. Um, let me swing around and look that one up. Uh, sorry, I didn't do it. Look at these earlier, but I ran out of time. Know any good aluminum welders? <laughs> I figured out that uh, oh, I'm not a good welder, but hey, everybody's got to know their limitations. It is what it is. Let's switch over and see what uh, what's in the live chat. All right, Nick. Hey, John, I recently did a 440 kit of the Stage 3 hot cams and some other mods. What do you recommend for the break-in process? Actually, I did a, a little short video that um, addressed whether you were do, breaking in a, a, a utility type or a sport type ATV or motorcycle. It really doesn't matter. Well, why don't you reference that video? But basically, run it a little easy for the first, I don't know, three or four miles, and then I just go ahead and let it just hammer it. I'm sorry, but I, 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 I break them in like I'm going to ride them. That's as, as simple as that. But if you want to, uh, if the guys will drop that, uh, how do I break in my my new engine or rebuilt engine in the chat and uh, let Nick take a peek at that. Well, is it a 440 kit on a um, on a 400EX? Because I'm thinking about doing that on, on ours, which y'all haven't even seen it yet. Pano Geotis. Hey, John, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Pano. And it looks like your package the, or the package that we sent out had one wrong digit on your address and it's coming back to us. We're going to correct that and then send it right back out the door. All I can say is we're sorry, but, so, but I'm not giving up. Oh, <clears throat> BRB, go, got to go enter that code again. All right, be right back. Gotcha. <laughs> Well, come on back, Hannah Hill. <sighs> William, what's the box called on a four-wheeler that's called the brains? That should be the guy, the guy or girl riding it. Now, usually uh, they uh, either call it an ACU or some people call it a CDI. Uh, that's kind of a misnomer as, uh, as they've gotten more advanced. They do a lot more than a, uh, a CDI box, which is basically just ignition, you know, uh, pulsing. Uh, they do a lot more than that now. So I'd say an ECU. Mm, Christopher Rose. Hi, John. I have an 05 TRX 450R that will bang and pop on deceleration. All right. I would wonder what your uh, your your jetting is on decel. You may need to richen it up a little bit and get it to quiet down some because uh, that's what it's trying to do. Kind of, in other words, you need to flood it to get it to make it quit popping. So this is basically igniting inside the uh, the exhaust header. <clears throat> you think it's spring around here, Nick? Yeah, I think he just an answered your question. Yep. Reach out your bike. It's either running too lean or too rich. He is correct. I would say to richen it up to um, quelch the uh, quelch the popping. All right, sorry, uh, sorry, sent that too soon. Starts and runs and idles great, just clean carb and uh, still does it. The machine has stage two hot cam and full DNS exhaust system. Your thoughts also, the three wire yellow lead. All right, you're losing me a little bit here, Chris. Um, what did you ask me? Yeah, well, it would still apply to all of that. Um, yeah, it sounds like your, your jetting is just a little off and richen it up some. Cody, JT is the man. We appreciate you, brother. Uh -huh. we, we here at Team Partzilla appreciate all of y'all, no doubt. Um, he says, that he, oh, the yellow wires. When the stator heats up and has melted one of the connectors in the gray connector, would you have any idea? Yeah, that, that is your, your stator wiring, I believe. And it sounds like you've lost one of the, the coils in there. And or you could have been, uh, may have a damaged... Um, a regulator rectifier, but we've done a bunch of videos and I think we did one on that particular one. If the guys want to uh, drop that in the chat as well, the, uh, 
no, no charge condition on the 400 EX. PZAC 83. Good evening. I have a Yamaha Dragster 1996 with a bad plane bearing on the connector rod. How do I find the correct bearing color? Um, if I open the connector rod, will I see the color? It's not guaranteed. Uh, yeah, they do have the colors on there, but over time, those will wear off. And we did a, a complete build on a Yamaha R6 where I go in detail Yamaha's procedure, and it should transfer over to an R1 as well, although the specs are going to be different, of course, of how you determine the, uh, the color. So if, uh, guys, if we will drop that in there as well, we can maybe get PZAC 83 going in the right direction. Um, it's a pretty simple process, though. You'll find numbers and you know, numbers on the stamped on the, the crankshaft, and then you'll have numbers stamped on the um, the connector rods, and also another set of numbers for the, your um, your your main your main bearings. And you just look at a chart where those two intersect. That's going to be your your bearing color, and hence its thickness. But as I said earlier in this uh, chat, you do want to go ahead and verify that with plastic gauge. And just to make sure, you know, nine times out of 10, they're going to be spot on. But if you really want to be sure, go to plastic gauge it just to check it. Um, Clavis, 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 what a great thing you did being here. You did a Grom uh, BBK. I had serious issues with my Kitco 181. Can you help me back to Honda Specs now? That's how bad it was for me. Oh boy, what what all went wrong with it, Klaus? If you'll, uh, I may not be able to answer all your questions straight from the hip, but drop in uh, what's going on with it. Um, when I did that uh, that 170 kit, it, it was little, ugh, it was a little challenging to get it tuned correctly, but um, we did eventually figure it out. So maybe I can help guide you through that, or at least what we did. <clears throat> Hello from Argentina. Oh, hello, Argentina. I'm using my, my daughter's mechanic, but I'm a, a mechanic also. Oh, okay, Michaela Aldenez. Well, hello down there. How's it going? All right, Big Josh. Happy holidays to y'all. I like that, y'all. I have a 96 Kawasaki 750R. The swing arm chain adjuster broke all flush from rust. Any suggestions on getting that bolt out? Oh, boy. Nothing like the extracting a bolt. Um, there, there's a couple of different extractor kits out there. It's so satisfying when they actually work, but that's probably an eight millimeter thread or even a six that you're dealing with. So it's going to be tough because the tools that, you know, you drill into it and you better have it dead centered and you get it in there. And then if you break the tool off, it's going to make it even more difficult because you can't drill those tools because the metal is so dang hard. What I would probably suggest dealing with that is to go ahead and drill it all the way out and get a time cert of the same um, pitch and diameter and just time cert it and be done with it. That's going to be the best way because if it's rusted in there and it actually broke the bolt, I mean, actually broke the, the body of the bolt, it's really in there. And sticking in an even smaller diameter tool is probably not going to pop it out. But hey, Drill it out, heat it up, and see if you can get one of those bolt extractors to pull it out. Uh, I, it's been very hit and miss when I've done that in the past. And sometimes it's easier just to say, all right, we're going to sand this flat. I'm going to, uh, for the, just a side grinder. That way I can definitely hit a, a flat surface, a dead center of the threads, drill it out, and just time sort it and be done with it. Mm. Oh, yep. Answered that. Uh, Hannah says, "Don't worry. I'll, I came back. I'm trying to learn some stuff." Well, we are here to teach some stuff. <laughs> uh, Peace, like 83. What if the numbers on the connecting rod is not showing? Oh boy. Yeah, I've run into that before too. Then you're gonna have to do it the hard way. Um, pick a. You only have to buy one. Um, uh, buy one set in the middle range of the uh, the uh, the bearings in plastic gauge, and that that initial one's going to tell you which way to go up or down uh, to get it in and get it in range. I've I've been through that too. It's just not a lot of fun. 
Uh, but that uh, R6 build, uh, I did go back and I went through and plastic aged everything so I can show you how to do that. David, thank you, John. You are welcome, David. KTT, good evening. I have a Daytona hmm, 675. No one ever told me you should, you should never get a truck from a running truck. Oh boy. I'm wondering what's the worst damage that it could have been done besides the rectifying the stator. More than that, I would have been worried about the, uh, the ECU on it. But yeah, that kind of power behind, uh, you know, potentially going into the system voltage wise, uh, that, that may have uh, done it in. But more than likely, your stator and more than likely your, um, a regulator rectifier, they were probably damaged anyway, because why did it need to jump? That'd be my question. Was it uh, not charging correctly to begin with? Hmm. Pedro is asking me, hey, John, I'm having a problem with my 2016 Razor 1000S with the front differential. Do you know of any side by, do you know any uh, side by side stuff or do you only work on ATVs? Uh, can I ask the question so you can give me a, a different perspective? Well, of course, we work on side by sides. There's one sitting right here. That is a white Z1000R. And I did some extensive work on a 2000, gosh, has it been that long? 15 or was it a, a 13? Uh, one of the original Razor 900s. So, yeah, ask away. Come on. All right. Pedro says so my armature plate broke at first so my front different so my front differential lock so i bought a rebuild kit with a seal bearing and new armature but i put everything back together and when i put it on i noticed that my cable all right i guess you'll finish up that sentence in a minute it's only 317 guys and i've already caught up with you hmm. well we'll let pedro finish asking his question and then i'll see if i can get him an answer all right was stripped and I imagine that is what was giving an engine light. Possibly. What was the initial, uh, okay, your armature plate broke. Sounds like it wasn't fully engaged. And if that was the case, yeah, I could see how you could snap it. And could the cable cause that? I think so. So I think you answered your own question. Guys, what are y'all talking about over here? All right. No, we're not going to dive into that. Okay. Um, the Pedro also came back, but I lifted the razor and put it on in reverse and an all four wheels move with the four wheel drive off. All right, that may be just a little bit residual in there. It may, they may spin, but they're not fully engaged. So don't fall into that trap I have as well. Um, if you actually did try to hold the front, in the, if they're not engaged, and if you actually tried to hold them, you could probably hold them still. So it, it's just a friction, for lack of a better term, inside of the gear case, even though the gears are not locked in. It's just the friction of them being nearby if you want to call it that or resting against each other that may be causing that then he said one more thing and when i put it in high it only spins the rear tires ah so you're, that's i think i was right on my initial assessment it was not engaging all the way and then kicking it out hence what bro bro broke your armature plate so it, it's not engaging all the way and it was kind of in that in between world if we want to call that all right, yeah, give it a shot and let us know. We'll be next speaker of the week after because I'm not going to be here. But I will be back in my, my chair, God willing, on, uh, after the first of the year. All right, we'll swing back around to a couple more questions from last week. Now, shame on me. I ask for these questions and then I do a cold read right now. Kind of defeats the purpose me doing the research except on the honda i did do that one but i didn't go any further i ran out of time i'll just be honest james had asked me i have a 2006 rancher es and the push start button doesn't start battery is good headlights don't come on either 
please tell me where to start. James, it's gonna be really simple. Go look at our 2003 Honda Rancher and look at its playlist. And I'll walk through a no start scenario on that particular unit. So, and I go through testing the, I believe the, the start stop switch, the, the on off switch, which is basically your kill, kill switch or your run switch. Make sure it's not something simple like that. I mean, you're not the only person that that's, that's been caught in that one before, but look for the easy stuff first. But uh, if you would go check out that unit's playlist and I'll walk you through um, taking a look at it. Make sure I don't have any other questions. Um, Hannah came back. Uh, Pedro, get rid of the, <laughs> get rid of it. Get you a bike. Sold my for a 750R. Put a power commander on it. Is there anything else you, you, I can do for it? That's about all you can do at that point. <laughs> on something uh, old 750Z. Those were great or are great machines. A little long in the tooth, but they're still great machines. Brad Thompson had asked me, how's it going? I'm having problems with my kill switch. It seems to be a reoccurring, reoccurring thing. And the fuel pump not priming when I turn the kill switch on. Check my fuses, check battery and all the lights and everything else works. Just the fuel pump and my secondary throttle not priming. Any, uh, any info might be appreciated. All right. This is where you need to invest in either um, a uh, test light or a voltage meter because it sounds like everything else going up to the fuel pump is, is working, but we need to verify that. So we need to see if there's actually power. And you didn't tell me which make and model, but I guess this really doesn't matter because all, um, all systems like that, where you've got a fuel pump inside uh, the fuel tanker nearby, they all have to have voltage and it's all going to be a 12 volt system. So you need to just go in and check to make sure it's getting power. And if it is, well, you have your answer. Do you need fuel pump? That's probably going to be the case because it looks like you did most of your homework getting uh, getting to this point. Baker had asked me, Grizzly 700, new starter, battery, and solenoid. The stator was replaced last year by the dealer. After 30 minutes, I tried to shut it off and it acted like it was trying to start. <laughs> Uh, ulti it ultimately shut off. The battery was dead. What say you? Well, it sounds like your regulator rectifier is the one thing that as is at fault. Um, but you said it was like it was trying to start. I assume that you were hitting the button. It was just trying to crank over slowly because because it had a dead battery. Well, it, it sounds like well maybe they shouldn't replace the stator. Or they should have done the regulator rectifier. Nine times out of 10, that's what it's going to be. Um, if you came back around for me to answer this, uh, I, I know that we did a, uh, a no charge condition on our Grizzly 700. So jump into uh, go over to our YouTube channel. And of course, you're already there and find the playlist for our 700 and it will be in there. Mm -hmm. All right, Snapple Meister had asked me what the name that is. <laughs> Great videos. One quick question. If your clutch cable keeps snapping down at the bottom near the engine, can this uh, be a sign that you need to rebuild the clutch? Well, I'd say definitely yes. I think I already answered this one for some reason. It's, maybe it's just a, a repeat. Yeah, if, if you're putting that much stress on the cable to where it's snapping it, it providing that you are using a, a uh, either a high quality or the factory OEM cable, then you probably need to go in and you must have hands of claw death <laughs> to snap that many cables. I've been getting all kind of arthritic. So they're not quite as tough as they used to be. Wham, wham, wham. <laughs> all right. Well, guys, I've caught up with you in the uh, part Zilla. guys have dropped everything else in there. Well, Pedro did come back one more time before going. If the cable is stripped, do you think it could be fixable or not? A local dealership says it's not. And then I will need to buy a new side cover. They're probably right on that. Uh, I don't even know what thread that would be in there for that, for that, uh, that cable that you're talking about to get it to engage. 
Yeah, they're probably right. So I doubt you can time cert that. I just, I'd find it hard to believe that uh, you could match up the threads, but hey, take a look, um, get a standard bolt or you know, a couple of different sizes, different threads and see if um, you can determine what uh, what pit, thread pitch and diameter that it is. Okay. Yeah, well, what's the worst? Case? You know, just make sure you're using metric. Um, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, won't be able to match up anything. But hey, give it a shot. Then maybe, maybe time sort of never tried it before, but you could be a trailblazer here. All right, guys, I'll hang for another minute or two, see if there's one more cable or one more question that I didn't get to last week. Kirk had asked me, I replaced the stator on a 2012 Polaris Ranger 500 EFI 4x4. Did the AC test on the stator while running like your video shows? It shows 9.8 volts on all phases. Do different machine stators put out less AC volts while running? You're going to see a pretty wide range, but 9.8 volts, especially if you're followed exactly and they're doing it in a AC, that's way too low because on an alternating current cycle, you uh, to, to actually develop a 12 volt DC charge, you would need at least 24 volts. I mean, there's just no way because they have to rectify it and then um, flatten it out, so to speak. So you've got going plus and minus, they flip it up, that cuts it in half, that gets it almost flat. Then they use a capacitor of some type to get you know a steady state of um, uh, DC voltage. So nine's way too low. That would give you, you know, less than five volts DC charge. Sorry, engineer trying to come out in me. Go away. <laughs> All right, guys. Oh, Clavius. Yeah, you dropped a bunch of questions on me right when I was about to sign off. So you barely made it under the wire. All right. Oh, the, this is uh, the, the Grom build. It's 181 cylinder injector, type 2 camshaft, foam oil filter, aero exhaust. It was just slow to start. On the road, it was on par with the OG, a Chinese exhaust, no other modifications on track. I mean, straight the o o OG Groms would fly by. Finally, after 5K kilometer, it stopped working. And I got it to run again somehow, but soon after it would not idle a few times. Uh, the engine did not, RPMs were up and down. Eventually, uh, even starting the engine was difficult. As soon as all Honda parts were installed back, it all works again. Mm. What are some of the supply chain issues that you're running into in your shop currently? Also, thanks for great content. Wow, that's disappointing. That, that there's so many changes that uh, you made on it, you know, like we did on ours. You would just have to go through and pick it apart. I mean, this, this could be part of the control system. This could be problems with the, I was leaning toward the injector since you told me it was replaced. Uh, I, I know that's painful having to go put everything back stock where you build all the stuff and the, 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 the stock stuff is you know, just blowing your doors off. And, but honestly, if you go and put everything back on, you just have to start picking it apart one piece at a, one piece at a time until you find out what went wrong or what piece is not working wrong or correctly. I'm not familiar with the kit that you were using. Uh, I can't tell you that the COSO kit that we used, um, it, it was good. And uh, I, if, if anybody knows where that bike ended up, I'd love to know. I mean, uh, we delivered it to the winner and he just, disappeared. So if anybody out there in Grom world uh, sees the Partzilla, Partzilla Grom scooting around, yeah, I'd love to see a picture of it. Hopefully it's not sitting in his garage with a dead battery and flat tires. <laughs> uh, Dewey had asked me, John, what are some of the supply chain issues you were Can I call you back in a little bit? Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, what are some of the supply chain issues you are running into mostly in the, in the shop currently? Also, thanks for the great content. It's hit and miss. It is so sporadic as to what we're having trouble getting. And uh, it, it's not so much us getting it. It's the, uh, the manufacturers of the manufacturers themselves and then the aftermarket guys as well. 
it, it's just so hit and miss. Um, and, you know, everybody knows there's that big chip issue, but you know, we'll have machines get delivered to the dealership that'll be missing like a control knob or you know a steering wheel logo. I mean, just the oddest of things. But the, the manufacturers were so backed up with the almost completed units, they were actually shipping them out, shipping them out 98% complete because they have nowhere else to put them. And then the dealership gets to finish them up. But answer your question is just it's just hit and miss. But hopefully this will uh, this will even out shortly. All right, guys. Looks like there's a couple more questions, but it is 3:30, and I'm officially on vacation. <laughs> so, Michael, um, we'll uh, we'll write down those those two questions, and then I'll I'll start off the new year with those. How is that? Does that sound like a deal for me or for you? Tyler, we'll get to you as well. Well, listen, guys, I'm about to sign off and go enjoy time with friends and family and everybody else. So if you're if you um, are enjoying when celebrating Christmas or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah or you don't you don't celebrate anything, at least be kind to your your fellow human beings out there, especially important during this time of year. Well, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for making 21 a great year, and 22 is going to be even better. And I can't wait, I cannot wait to show you everything that uh, we as a company have lined up and coming down the pipe. It's going to be crazy fun. So everybody have a great Christmas, a great New Year's, and we will see you in 22.